the sentiments of those last two songs certainly are characteristic of all of those who love the Lord, all members of the church who are faithful in desiring to be more like Christ by following his teaching day by day. I'm sure that most people prefer to think about pleasant, happy, and peaceful things. And when I say pleasant, happy, and peaceful, I'm thinking of how the Bible presents happiness and peacefulness. Thus we, because of that, emphasize God's love for us and all He has done to save us from our sins. And as we go out to teach others the truth, seek to convert them to Christ by the gospel, and as we seek to build one another up, edify one another as brethren, then we seek to emphasize the love of God and the care of God, the providential works of God on behalf of His children, and how that when all is said and done with this life, if we've been faithful, then we will hear, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. But in teaching the whole counsel of God, then we must also deal with the justice of God and the state of people who do not use this life to find God, who do not respond to the love of God in loving, faithful obedience to the gospel, His power to save, Romans 1.16 who die outside of Christ in their alien sins, or, since most of the New Testament's written to Christians to keep them faithful, those who became Christians but ceased to live as the New Testament teaches in walking in the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25, that there's going to be a place and a state of being for those people because God is not only a God of love but a God of justice. Many times we don't hear that because the current attitude is let me do as I please, don't judge me. And yet the Bible from, old fellow said one time, from one lid to the other <laughs> is full of material where God judged his people. God judged the world in various places in the world. As surely as God then is love, and we need to do a lot of study about that, then He is a God of justice. He is a just God. And frankly, today people do not want to hear about the justice of God. Yet Paul, in writing to the church in Rome, chapter 11 and verse 22 said, Behold, therefore, the goodness, well, we like to stop there, the goodness of God. But he didn't do that, did he? He said, Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. And he says, On them which fell, severity. But toward thee, goodness, and that's conditional. If thou continue in his goodness, well, what's going to happen if you don't? Otherwise, thou also shall be cut off. It must be understood then that you cannot properly understand the gospel of Jesus Christ that God has given to us to save us, that the church is to preach to every creature without understanding the justice of God. There are those churches or religious groups that actually deny a concept of hell as a place in a state of being designed by God for those who reject Him here and do not receive His love and humble obedience to the truth. Principally among those churches are the so-called Jehovah's Witness. In their Let God Be True book published by the Watchtower Society in Brooklyn, New York, the second edition, page 99, here is what they say. The doctrine of a burning hell where the wicked are tortured eternally after death cannot be true. Mainly for four reasons. One, it is wholly unscriptural. 
Two, it is unreasonable. Three, it is contrary to God's love. And four, it is repugnant to justice. Now, I quote from those books produced by the Watch Tower Society anytime I want to know where Jehovah's Witness group stands because that's their official doctrinal organ. That's what they appeal to as far as what guides them and their thinking and their teaching. What is most fascinating is that the ones who argue the hardest against hell many times are folks who once believed in it. Of course, we, we can talk about the atheist who says, I know God does not exist and I can prove it. That's what it takes to be a real atheist. Uh, they don't believe in heaven or hell, spirits or anything else. They're just materialists. So I choose some group like so-called Jehovah's Witnesses. I could use some of the Adventists. And a number of others today, which you might expect in view of the materialism, secularism that's permeating churches. I understand, though it's not written in their official creeds, that the Anglican or Episcopals are gradually getting away from the idea of a place after the Day of Judgment where people who are wicked are put into hell, as we read of it in the Bible, to never come out to pay because God is a God of justice. And when you look at something like Facebook or whatever, it doesn't make any difference what kind of heinous, ungodly life somebody's lived. If down at the bottom of it, they're going to have R.I.P., which means rest in peace. Listen to me. If the Bible is true, and it is, no one rests in peace who dies guilty of sin. Guilty of sin. No one. That's the point that must be made. God has made provision where every sin can be covered by the blood of Christ, shed from Christ's body because He knew no sin. He was the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. The blood we contact when we're baptized into Christ as penitent believers having confessed our faith in Him. 1 John 1, 7 says plainly, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanseth us from all sin. I've said over and over again, that's present tense in the Greek. Which in Greek means it continues to cleanse as I walk in the light. Well, I don't know how to determine what walk in the light is except to look at Acts 2.42. Let the Bible be its own commentary to continue steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine. I can't conceive of somebody walking in the light and not continuing steadfast in the Apostles' Doctrine. And I can't conceive of anybody continuing steadfast in the Apostles' Doctrine and not walking in the light. One's a commentary on the meaning of the other. Thus being steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, which is our duty, it's being faithful. We have hope. We have expectation of salvation eternally. And that's wonderful to hear. But what are those who reject the gospel? What are those who do not seek God while they're on this earth? And he made this as a place to find him. We're free moral agents. I choose what I want to do with my life. And I can look for God, which God intended me to do. Or I can just live as if this is all there ever is going to be. And most people choose the latter. And then there are those in the church who believe for a while but then they fall away for various reasons. You can read that in the parable of the seed, Luke 8, and so on. You can let the cares of this world, the affairs of this world become more important to you even after you've obeyed the gospel. And thus you can drift back in to those particular things. And they don't necessarily have to be immoral and godly things. They can just be things of this world that begin to take up far more time than we give to the kingdom and the purposes of the kingdom. Now to the atheist or to even others, for us to talk about and warn people and try to move people to love God and keep His commandments so heaven will be their home, thus we tell them about hell. And we emphasize those passages that says, and it's such a shame, it's horrible to think about, that most people who are accountable to God will lose their soul in hell. There's nothing that says the majority of people who have ever lived who are accountable to God will go to heaven. Nothing. 
Nothing in the Bible says that. In fact, Jesus even said, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on earth? Well, the Word of God's going to be here. Is heaven and earth pay, pass away, Jesus said, my Word won't. Well, what does he mean? Will people still be believing it? Will they still be following it? Because the church can't exist where people don't have the truth of God revealed in the Word of God guiding their lives. Is hell scriptural? Now, they said that it wasn't, the Job's Witnesses. And by the way, I don't want to pass from that till I point out that we even had certain members of the church in recent years deny that there's a place that is like hell, a lake with burns, with fire and brimstone, which is the second death, death meaning second permanent eternal separation from God, where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. But people will ask sometimes, what do you people in the Church of Christ believe on this? My ready answer, every time is anything and everything. That's the wrong question. The right question is, what does the Bible teach on it? And that's how we ought to approach everything. Well, is hell unscriptural? Now, the King James Version, put out in 1611 first, use the terms Hades and hell interchangeably. And people today say, see, it's all outdated and all that kind of thing. Well, it wasn't for its time. Because they use the word hell in a way we don't use it today. And we think of hell as the final abode of the wicked after the day of judgment when this material system is long gone. But they use the word hell not only for that, but they use it as a hidden place. They would speak of helling their potatoes. Now, if you're not raised on a farm, or at least where you raise potatoes and store them, then they simply meant covering up with dirt or pulling them into the cellar. They were hidden. The fellow who roofed your house was not just a thatcher. That had to do with a thatched roof. But was a hellier because he put the roof on the house and it was hidden. You couldn't see in it. Language, living language, changes. Thus, it's not as much a bad translation as you might think it would be. It's just the language has changed. And we think of hell today as the final abode of the wicked. So people reading the King James Version sometimes get confused. But I must say this. If you're just going to read something and never look up words, you're not much of a student of anything. You wouldn't think that if you're going to be an engineer or you're going to be a medical doctor or you're going to be a carpenter, you better study what words mean. So to really be a student and all that that means and give diligence, as Paul said in 2 Timothy 2.15, you're going to have to look up meaning of words in context, who's speaking, who's being spoken to, what is the subject under consideration, etc. So I would say that, yes, that could be confusing, but to the real student, that's the reason they invented Bible dictionaries, which are easily found at the tap of your finger on Googling it. I do wish most of my preaching life I had had a computer and the Internet. The time I spend on researching things now is so much faster than it was years and years ago. I remember how we rejoiced so much when we were in college and they got copiers and we had to write term papers. I didn't have to take those little three-by-five note cards and uh, go sit down and make my notes that I wanted to quote from my term papers and then all of that. I could just go take that book, slap it down on the copier, and I had it. I could take it back to my room and work on it that way. Well, now you go online. I found a situation this past week, a very good study on textual criticism, and the fellows in some college up north, and uh, I found him on Facebook. I wrote him. I said, I saw your presentation on that. Is there any way I can get a hold of that? He wrote me back and he said, invite me to be a friend and I'll send you a free copy. <laughs> couldn't beat it. It's some of the best material I've seen. Well, I couldn't have done that not many years ago. So there's no excuse for us today, more than ever, not to really be students of the Bible. What are we talking about? We're talking about not only a state of being when we speak of hell, but a place. 
a place of eternal punishment for those who reject the love of God here. Does the Bible teach such a thing? Well, listen to Matthew 25, 41 through 46. Matthew inspired the Holy Spirit. He's an apostle of Christ. He's writing part of the New Testament, and he's recording Jesus' own prediction of the day of judgment. Matthew 25, 41, reading, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was in hunger, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in. Naked, and you clothed me not. Sick and in prison, and you visited me not. Then shall they answer, or also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hunger, or thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. Then look at the last part of it. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Now he said what he meant, and he meant what he said. And it's for our own edification. And I can't preach the old counsel of God if I don't preach that. And we're answering the question, is hell unscriptural? Well, if that's scripture, then it sounds pretty scriptural to me. Notice that two places are described very vividly. The wicked are sent to eternal punishment in a place with eternal fire, and the righteous to a place of eternal life. If there's not an eternal hell, there's not an eternal heaven. They're described in both the same, almost you might say the same breath, if you were speaking. And you can't get over that if you want to accept the Bible as the Word of God. So if heaven exists, and hell exists. And that's a very important point to keep in mind. Notice the passage of Mark 9. Verses 42 through 48 along the same line. Talking about the scripturalness of things. And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It's better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell. Into the fire that never shall be quenched. Where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Seems to be a little bit camped on that business of a fire that's not quenched. quenched. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It's better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Now how many times does God have to repeat himself before it's true? And as Jesus often did in an economy of words, he had no problem expressing the will of God on this matter. And it's for your good and my good that I read and understand this. So yes, uh, Scripture talks about those things. Notice the terms of eternity. Their worm dieth not. Folks, that's maggots working in a dead body. And the fire that shall never be quenched. Does that sound like it's going to go out? It also implies a body never decays since their worm does not die. Now watch it. If you have studied this much, you've noticed it. That most every uh, revelation in the New Testament concerning the resurrected body pertains to the glorified resurrected body of the saved. Little is said about the resurrected body of the lost. It's called a resurrection of damnation. And we get an idea here because the worm continues to be the worm that that body may look more like a world full of zombies that's been depicted. You wanted this body, you got it forever. But it suffers because of your own decision to reject God in life and not use this life to find God and serve Him faithfully. So it implies that the body never ceases to decay since their worm dieth not. Now, the word translated hell that the Holy Spirit had the writer use is Gehenna. 
It literally means or comes from the valley of Hinnom. And Jesus alludes to Josiah's defilement of the valley of Hinnom in 2 Kings 23 and verse 10. When Israel apostatized and they went into idolatry, they used that valley to make human sacrifices. When Josiah came along, he turned it into a garbage dump. And some try to explain away hell by saying Gehenna was only a reference to the city dump. Yeah, but why was it the city dump? It was because of the hateful conduct and of idolatry that offered human sacrifice, especially babies offered on red-hot arms of the idol to die excruciatingly. Here's what J.W. McGarvey in the fourfold gospel had to say about the idea that it was just a garbage dump. Some commentators endeavor to make this third punishment a temporal one and assert that fires are kept burning in the Valley of Hinnom and that as an extreme punishment, the bodies of criminals were cast into those fires. But there's not the slightest authentic evidence that any fire was kept burning there, <clears throat> nor is there any evidence at all that casting a criminal into the fire was ever employed by the Jews as punishment. It was the fire of idolaters' worship in the offering of human sacrifice which had given the valley its bad name. This caused it to be associated in the mind of the Jews with sin and suffering and led to the application of its name in the Greek form of it to the place of final and eternal punishment. When the conception of such a place as hell was formed, it was necessary to give it a name and there was no word in the Jewish language more appropriate for the purpose than the name of this hideous valley. Basically, people argue that the dump must be there in order to explain their view of Jesus' statement. But that logic is backwards from what it ought to be. If they knew their Bible, and Jesus could easily have said this to people who they thought that way then, and I can say it now to them, uh, you do err not knowing the Scriptures, know the power of God. So, even if such a dump existed, Jesus wasn't referring to it it because he talks about the fires being eternal they don't quit revelation 20 and verse 10 and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever well if you were going to say somebody was tormented forever without let up how would you say it other than that way could you find any other way to say it? And that word is said to us. God wanted us to read that and understand something. The Bible's written for us, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Again, there are terms of eternity, tormented for ever and ever. The same term is actually used for God's existence in Revelation 4, 9, where the four beasts or the living creatures, as they're translated to be in the American Standard 1901, are falling before the throne. And they're declaring God to be forever and ever. As well as the saints who reach heaven in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 5. They're said to reign forever and ever. Now if forever and ever doesn't mean eternally, then we're not going to reign eternally forever and ever. And God doesn't uh, exist forever and ever. Such is where people go when they try to deny the plainness of the Bible. This is a place of fiery punishment. You say, well, material things are gone. How can it be a fire? Well, you know, I don't know how to answer people like that because they can only think in terms of this world and as things are now. I was studying one time. Several of us were in a Jehovah's Witness uh, building. And I had all my collection of Jehovah's Witness books. And we were talking about eternal fire. And they want to make it just fire that comes from eternity. And it burns up and it's gone. And he couldn't. He said, you, you tell me how you can just, and you did this. Take up dirt and burn that into nothing. I said, well, if I was God, I guess I could. I mean, it doubts the power of God. You do air, and I know the scriptures of the power of God. And that was said to people who denied resurrection and spirits and were total materialists of his day, the sect of the Sadducees. And these are just modern-day Sadducees. Listen to Revelation 21, verse 8. 
But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, that covers the white lies, you know, shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The second separation is a permanent separation, and here's where they're going to be. There's no hope. Yeah, I was pretty sick last November and December, but there was hope that I could get better, even at my age. And I did. But when you enter in the eternal fires of damnation, having rejected God on this earth, there's no hope. You're just there where the worm dies not and the fires are not quenched. So the contention that it's unscriptural is just not upheld by the Bible. Is hell unreasonable? It may be to the person who thinks like a human being and that's all. But uh, we've got to learn to think like God and the only way I know to do that is to listen to what he says in the book. Imperfect man, they say, I'm reading from Watchtower Society, Let God Be True, page 98. The imperfect man does not torture even a mad dog, but kills it. And yet the clergymen attribute to God, who is love, the wicked crime of torturing human creatures merely because they had the misfortune to be born sinners. Well, of course, he's kicking at Calvinism there. But he's still saying that people who die lost suffer forever, and that's just unreasonable. Just unreasonable. And that's what they write in their book, and I suppose they meant what they said, and they said what they meant. And I can only go on what they put out for public consumption to figure out what's going on. Man's problem is that he does not accept the gravity of his crime. There's the problem. We don't see sin as any big deal. It's just not. You see it even in the church. People might get upset if you're a fornicator and an adulterer or a homosexual. They might. But how you deal with them, then other people might have different views of how you deal with them. They're not going to be too upset if people miss services quite a bit for no reason at all. Well, why? One's a moral, immoral activity. The other's a religious thing that's violating the Hebrews 10.25. The murderer in prison, who is a murderer, he's not there by accident or some confusion of the law, most all of them say, I didn't do it. I'm not guilty. Or if they do say they're guilty, they've got some extenuating circumstances, but it always gets them off. Have you noticed that? Well, if you'll notice the rich man in um, the place of departed spirits and torment, if you'll notice him, you'll see that uh, he didn't have any respect for the Word of God. Abraham directed him right back to that on this earth. He wanted something more than the Word of God. How serious is the crime of sin? Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 through 31. For if we sin willfully, after that we've received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. When you do what these Jewish Christians were about to do, just say, well, we're going back into Judaism to escape, persecution as Christians we're just cutting off the New Testament and nothing left when you leave the New Testament there's not any other way of salvation well what is left but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries I won't read the rest of it but he says you know what happened to the law of Moses it's going to be far worse for those who reject what Christ has brought a sore punishment Man has been created in the image of God. His spirit is eternal. But because man claims it does not make sense to him, does it follow that it's truly unreasonable? Prophet Isaiah had a problem with people doing that in his day. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We must understand that God has ordained a way of salvation. And to a great many people, the way of salvation is foolishness, and Paul recognized that and talked about it in 1 Corinthians 1 and 2 and so on. 
Man has a way of viewing things, and he thinks that's important. God looks at things and says, this is the way it ought to be. And even though it doesn't look that way to you, this is the way I want it, and it will be. Think about Noah and the flood and how God chose to save Noah and his family from the flood. That was foolish to those people round about, and so it's always been. And I want to close on this note. I'll continue on with this another time. Paul, in writing to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians 1, 18-21, says just what I was talking about a moment ago. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, or bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after the wisdom of uh, God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. He doesn't mean the manner of delivery. He means the message preached, the gospel. And thus Paul recognized those materialistic people who thought only on the basis of empirical evidence weren't apt to receive the revelation of God, no matter how many miracles were worked by him to confirm it's from heaven and not from men. And we must be ready for that in our dealings. So when you continue to study your Bible and you study the love and mercy and greatness of God in that way, know that to enjoy it, you must have a humble spirit Receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul and submit yourself to it and live by it all the days of your life. We studied a few moments ago about how one becomes a Christian. For the child of God, surely we recognize that when you obeyed the gospel that you resolved in your heart at that time, you would go forth living for him the rest of your life, faithful to your Lord in the church. If you have stumbled at that, you need to repent of those sins. And come back to him and confess to him and praying God for forgiveness. Let's rise up and realize that there is a day coming when the opportunity to change will be withdrawn. And the hand of forgiveness will no longer be there. If you need to obey the gospel, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.